Of course, of course. <laughs> Did you want this passed out now? Or after? Okay, should I start? Sure. Anytime you're ready. Okay, well, good afternoon. It's an honor to have today one of our own UTESCA trained geriatricians <laughs> present uh, GNG rounds, uh, Dr. Jeanette Ross who is a uh, staff physician here at GEC and the GREC, and she's the Associate Director for Palliative Medicine for the Fellowship, and she's, and, uh, she's also an Assistant Professor uh, at, at UTESCA. I get from, just got from uh, 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 Associate. <laughs> oh, okay, just from I'm yeah. sorry. My no, that's apologies. all right. We did Congratulations. update the CV. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Ross is going to talk about social media and healthcare, and her and the use of multimedia to enhance education in palliative medicine. Thank you. Right. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No, seriously, I'm um, glad to talk to you about um, uh, social media. It has been kind of like a passion, and I hope to get. Um, all of you enthusiastic enough to at least dip in, get an account. Um, I, I probably. How many people have Facebook accounts? I don't know. I'm I refuse. I don't have Okay. How about um, Twitter? How many people have Twitter accounts? Oh, okay. A YouTube channel or account? YouTube. YouTube, okay. Do you know about this thing called PATH? No? Sermo? Have you heard about Sermo? No? It's like a physician only. Um, Sermo? Sermo. Yeah, you, they have to verify your doctor and you can. It was. I don't know. I logged in just to see what it was. But there were some comments that I found a little bit disturbing because it's just kind of like. <laughs> venting, just a lot of venting there, and I was like, ooh. <laughs> I guess healthcare. Yeah. Well, I'm patient, but you oh. uh, But anyway, as you can see there, for the objectives for the session is to define what social media is and describe the most common available forms. There's lots of forms, and each day more things come up. There's a new thing called PATH my niece was telling me about that you can only do it's only for your closest 150 friends. <laughs> because she has like a, you know, like 800 friends in Facebook, but so she yeah. needs a smaller thing, so path, okay? <laughs> or you could just path, P-A-T-H, P -A -T -H, yeah. Uh, anyway, so, so I'm just going to narrow it down to those that you see there, Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, and then talk a little bit about the blogs, because I hope to get you at least reading some of the blogs. Um, and then I'll, I'll um, tell you some ways about how social media can impact healthcare, and then the potential pitfalls uh, when you're participating in social media. So as I was telling you, look at all those um, options there for, those are all social media. So let's plug it down a little bit. So what is social media? <clears throat> so they're internet-based tools for creating, sharing, and discussing information. Um, so this is the, when, remember, when we had internet first in the 90s, what you would do is you would go to the website and you would like find your information. and That was Web 1.0 and you would look up the address or you would look up whatever you need. But we're in the era of Web 2.0 where we are not only going to the internet to look up information, we are actually generating information. So if you want to know what I have for breakfast and I post it on Facebook, I'm generating that. But I can also generate some more interesting things. Um, but So there's these tools that we can, uh, you know, use to share information and we can create information. And, you know, it's just being a whole uh, set of other ways that we can share information um, besides the traditional ones. Um, <clears throat> so if we think about social networking and how it impact can have an um, is everybody familiar with the six degree of separation experiment? Where, where <clears throat> there's this thing that Kevin, Kevin Bacon, the actor, said, oh, I bet you within six degree of separation, I, I know everybody in Hollywood. Um, and then, so then there's this thing that goes backwards that, you know, if you get to six degrees, you probably know somebody that knows somebody that knows Kevin Bacon. 
Um, so that's kind of if if we're thinking this was the originally. Um, Oops. Um, this was originally thought for a uh, fax machine. So if you have two fax machines and you're connected, but if you have five fax machines and you're connected, that's a bigger network. But if this is, you know, you have all these users and look at all the connections you have, then you're more likely to have the friend of a friend of a friend that, you know, you get connected and you interact. Of course, if you are just on Facebook and you don't post anything or you don't have any friends, then that, that kind of loses its connectedness. But um, you can increase the connectedness if you have the number of users and how many and how connected you are. Um, so I'm going to start talking about Facebook. That's the one that probably most people know. Uh, and uh, it was launched in 2004. Initially, it was for college students. If you also the movie, um, the social network, you know the story. <laughs> but. Um, Right now, there's more than 800 million active users, and I got that from their Facebook statistics page. Um, and there's about 200 million people access the Facebook via their mobile device, and these are also the people that wake up in the morning, and one of the first things that they do before they get out of bed is like their status or see what their friends did or not. <laughs> <laughs> and they spend a lot of time on it, um, but um, you know, the, the, the people that are active users, they log in pretty much every day. Um, and this is, you know, how much data, is, it, humongous amount of data and photos and information is downloaded in the uh, Facebook. Come on in. There's some chairs here. Okay, thanks. Um, so if you think about it, <coughs> if Facebook was a country, it sort of would be the third most populated country in the world. So only India and China. Um, so maybe if you think of it as a language and being knowing knowing a culture, maybe you can't learn Chinese, you can learn Facebook better, right? <laughs> you should at least be familiar with it. The, the, you know, this social media I'm discussing now, you, you need to be at least familiar with. Um, yeah, I'm going to... Okay, how about that? It's a little bit bigger. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, and then there's also the need, oh, well, Facebook is just for uh, young people. Well, guess what? It's not just for kids and young people. Look at the new, the, who is the newest growing people? Um, you know, the 30 and older group is the newest people that are joining uh, now Facebook. Um, and so uh, this is not just for kids and young people anymore. Um, and this is some statistics of the average user. The average user has 130 friends, and they have liked about 80 pages, um, and they spend more than 50, you know, roughly an hour a day and Facebook each day, so um, that's a lot. So here are some groups, and here are some examples of the groups that I'm following Facebook. And uh, so this is the American Geriatric Society page, and they'll say things like, "Oh, don't forget to come to our meeting," and uh, "It opened now," and "Don't forget to submit your abstract," and the same thing for AHPM. Mm -hmm. And they'll also um, like this is the AHPM has their YouTube video that they. And they, there, here's a link to it. Um, so, and then last year they had this during the meet and greet during HPM. They had they take pictures of people with like why am I HPM member or why I come to H, and then they put them on the website. Um, so if you're when you're there this year in Denver, then you know come to the session. We also had a live tween and greet, but um, so that's the, the other use that I've had is like a, for networking. There's a group called the Palliative Networks. Um, it hasn't been so active lately, but we were more active before. Um, and we were taking turns sharing information that we had in our institution. So I shared our paint card there. And somebody in New Jersey said, hey, that paint card is great. Can we use it? And I said, sure. So <clears throat> some they used it to teach some nurses in New Jersey, about 80 nurses in New Jersey. I'm like, okay, well, and this is something that would have not happened had I not shared that. So, you know, I'm also about that, you know, we spend all this time creating a great product. I want more people to use it. And this is, you know, has been one of the sources where we can kind of like advertise or, or you know, put our resources there to use. Um, I, I've also used it, you know, like there's people like I've met maybe a little bit in person, but I'm not that friend, but we're friend enough to be friends of Facebook and just kind of seeing their other side um, of them, uh, you know, then we become a little bit more friends in real life because we've been on Facebook, but um, uh, here's the VA page. There's about 150 VAs that have their own uh, web pages, uh, and again, they'll say things like, um, 
um, over the holidays they had a little link of if you know of a veteran that's struggling with dealing with um, uh, the holidays, here's a link where they can call. Um, they also have, like, hey, okay, we have new services. They also had a link about the parking lot. Um, you know, last year, if you remember when we had that snow, the snowstorm, um, you know, they said, oh, clinics are going to be open up to the half day. So, you know, one more source where there was this information circulation of what was going around and what was going to happen with that snow day. Um, so, uh, and I, I noticed, you know, like when I first had looked at the page was maybe like September, October, and they had like 600 people, and now they're up to 759. So they, you know, slowly. Hopefully after today, they'll be up to a little bit more. <laughs> you guys can probably like the South Texas uh, page. Uh, but what kind of studies have been done about Facebook? A lot has been on the, you know, are, is your personality on Facebook the real Facebook? I mean, what, what do people do on Facebook? And, you know, are people obsessed about, oh, well, I, do I have more friends than that other person? And, uh, you know, are these really my true friends? And you're, like, comparing. Uh, so kind of like that, but... Um, I, I, there's also some um, other pieces about um, how breast cancer support groups, um, they, you know, they support each other and they have, uh, you know, a little group on the Facebook page and they uh, write comments to each other and they um, befriend each other. Um, then there's, a, there was a, they used it as a subject recruitment tool. They were trying to hunt down uh, nursing school graduates and that's where they found them in Facebook. Um, and they also wanted to generate um, interest in the profession. There was this pharmacy student where they, uh, the assignment was that they, after the session, they would put something about why geriatric and pharmacy in the page, and that generated some discussion that then kind of translated to the classroom. So that was a, a, as a tool that they used in teaching. Um, and this was um, in the you, the people in Alabama. Actually, <laughs> they um, they have a very nice project, an NIH five-year funded grant. Uh, where they are going to assisted living and nursing homes, and they are teaching the um, seniors uh, well some basic internet skills, how to you know just look something up or whatever. And then later on, when they're a little bit more familiar, they um, they teach them how to uh, go on Facebook and Twitter. And actually, the participants of the study had less depression um, because they felt more connected. They could go into their grandkids' Facebook page, and they were not missing out um, on these events. Um, they had this really big mouse, uh, mice for using the computer because they have like arthritis and they call them rats. <laughs> um, so I, I, I encourage you to you know go ahead and watch the little video. Um, you know what? I forgot to put that one in my reference. But if you just uh, go on your search engine of choice and put "move on Johnson and on on Facebook, this will come up at one of the third, uh, one of the first things. Uh, UAB. Um, but anyway, it's a little clip if you want to kind of pay attention. Um, now I'm kind of moving on. Any other, any comments or before we move on to Twitter? So, okay, so Twitter is an uh, online social networking and microballing service. It started in July of 2006. Uh, it has about 200 million active users and that are generating about 27 million tweets a day. Um, so do you may think that this is where you go to follow celebrities like Lady Gaga, and yes, you are right about she has. Like, she thinks she's a person with the most followers. She has like 14 million people following, so she has uh, quite a bit of people following her. Um, but if you if you look at it, the, this clip was one for nice. Yet the presentation in October. Um, now you're gonna do. It. Yeah, we don't have that many followers, but um, there's only like five people that are above um, 10 million, and it's like the president, Lady Gaga, um, Britney Spears, uh, and I can't remember who it is. Ashton Kutcher. Ashton Kutcher, except he's quit tweeting because he got in trouble for one tweet, and now somebody else tweets for him. I don't know. But anyway, so, but if you see here, I don't follow Lady Gaga, but. Um, I do follow Shakira. She's getting close to the 10 million. <laughs> um, but Lady Gaga, if you see here in this one, I don't know if you can read it here, but it says, from his own invention, I opened my browser to its homepage, and today it took my breath away. Uh, thank you, Steve. Going to eat apples all day. So this was the day after um, Steve Jobs died. Uh, and you know when you open your, you go your apple, and then 
if you are using your Apple computer, it goes into the website is typically the Apple page, and they have this, you know, Steve died. So that's probably what she did. Uh, so if you think, what was the impact of Steve Death's job? He actually caused a record, ten thousand tweets per second. Um, and I was actually on Twitter because that was a Wednesday when they announced that he died, and that's our regular uh, tweet chat. Mm -hmm. And we just couldn't do it because it was Twitter was we kept getting the Twitter is full, you know, just hang on, and we just like okay, let's just stop. <laughs> um, so there was a lot of people doing tweets, and they would use this is a hashtag where you know I may not be following Lady Gaga, but if I was searching for a thank you Steve, that's that sign. Um, my daughter calls it the tic-tac-toe sign, but it's <laughs> you know, like the pound sign and the thank you, Steve. Um, then I would, I could have, you know, seen her. Um, that's a, you know, like if you're interested in something, then you can, you know, look that up. And like if you do pound uh, HPM, then you'll see people writing tweets about hospice and palliative medicine. You don't need to specifically call one person. Uh, but anyway. <clears throat> To kind of put it in perspective, other things that have made records of tweets per second, Beyonce announcing that she was pregnant during the MTV <laughs> performance, that got 8,000 tweets. Uh, Japan beating the USA Women's World Cup, that got 7,000 beats. Uh, Osama Bin Laden was like 5,000 tweets. <laughs> I think Michael Jackson was like 4,000 tweets. It was a record in this time, but I guess there's more people to know now. Um, but anyway, so Steve Jobs got the record now. Um, so here's a little bit of how Twitter has helped save lives. So uh, Matthew Browning, he's a nurse, and um, his grandma had a rupture of Oda, and they were in some rural area of the state of Georgia. So he tweets that Emory Healthcare, it says, need help now, grandma with rupture of Oda, need cardiac surgeon, and OR, stat, ASAP, can you help us save quite like? He had already dialed 911 and his grandma wasn't, but he, she has a rupture at Orta and they don't have a trauma surgery when she is. She's in a little of nowhere hospital. But, but somebody's monitoring at Emory Healthcare and they respond, I'm Matthew Marion, call 911 or transfer the service. I mean, and you don't see the whole thing, but um, you, uh, you can, if you, again, do search, can Twitter help save life, you'll get to the article I explained to you exactly what happened. But anyway, so that, so basically, 17 minutes later, they've given him a transfer number, mm -hmm. and he's, they've got acceptance, and they got flight light going on, and then, you know, his grandma is on his way to Emory. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so here's one way. I don't think we, you know, we'll monitor that many <laughs> Twitter wow. accounts to have that kind of response. I, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't, they, the article didn't say, I think she did, but. Um, so here are some um, how you can use Twitter for professional interests. You could uh, follow, see what people or organizations are doing. You know, like there's the, you know, Montana Pali Care Team has a Twitter account. Um, you know, AHPM has a Twitter account. Um, Red Cross, you know, whatever, you know, organization. There's several DAs. I actually follow the DA one, and they, you know, they post interesting tweets, um, you know, with information with veterans. Um, What's and we that? have one that's specific for we something. Have we have Twitter again? Yeah. No. Does it follow your No. At C that people. It's, I see that people. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that would be a very good handle. <laughs> well, no, because like when I tweet, I'm, rep I'm tweeting as Janet Ross. I'm not tweeting as VA or Utesca because nobody has, you know, I don't have the, I'm not assigned to be the official voice of you know, any of the institutions, so I'm just done at Ross, so, um, but anyway, so when I first joined, I, I joined because I, 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 I wanted to follow Diane Meyer, and there was something about Diane Meyer's tweeting, and if, for those who don't know, she's a geriatrician and palliative medicine specialist, and she's really, if we want to have a true celebrity in our specialty, she's one of them, um, so that's, you know, what I started doing, and then I, I started seeing, like, she would tweet other people and then I got into oh Christian Sinclair okay let's follow him and and then um, I was also following Ty Meyer who graduated from our program and they were saying this thing oh Wednesday I'm doing tweet chat and so I called Ty and I'm like what's this tweet chat thing and how do you do it and um, so anyway so that's kind of how I got involved and I mostly 
participate in the Twitch chats. I don't generate a lot of content, but um, I mean, really, what Twitter is is kind of like a headline. It's kind of like when you see in the newspaper, like we saw this, and then it's a link to we'll go to this website, go to the blog, go to this article, um, and uh, we can. Also, last year was the first time that I used Twitter doing AHPM, and it was a great tool during American conference because even for people that were not there but they were following the hashtag, then you could see what was happening. Or you know how they have concurrent sessions and there's two sessions, and you want to be go to the one, but you're you can only be in one place. So I still will get you know information from this other session because somebody was there tweeting. Um, so it was interesting. Um, Twitter has it also used a research. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. But this is like Diane Myers. Um, she's got like 2,400 followers, so she's not, it's a little bit far from Lady Gaga, but she's kind of close to our stars. And she hasn't been tweeting as much lately. Um, Sandra thinks she has a special stock member to do that, but I really think that she does some of her tweeting because I've seen her, you know, like the little Blackberry, and, you know, sometimes her po tweets come out like at 10 p.m., or, you know, and it's like, there's no way you're paying somebody to pay tweet for you at 10 p.m. It's got, that's got to be her. I mean, um, and then, so this is Kristen Sinclair, so if you, you know, want to follow somebody, um, he's a palliative medicine specialist, and he uh, is the editor of the Palimed blog, um, and um, he is kind of like the little, that he's like a raw star because he's, you know, like he's got 16,000 tweets, I mean, if you think that, you know, multiply that by 140 characters, that's a whole book, or even more, um, you know, he's following... 2,000 people, but he's got 4,000 followers that, you know, that's getting, that he's got a significant impact. And he also does this thing that's called, like, the HPN Daily is out. So he's scouting all those things for hospice-related, and, and it's kind of like a newspaper. So when you go to the click, then there's all this, you know, uh, interesting articles that people have found, and uh, I've made it a couple of times to the HPN Daily, you know, top stories by, and he puts the handles of each person. Um, and so those are kind of useful, you find this useful information. Um, and then here's a person I started finding recently, this is, she's Vini Aurora, I guess if you're a medical educator, she's a doctor in Chicago and she, her interest is in the, um, residence provision and she has her own blog too about future doctors and, and uh, she was sharing about this meeting uh, where they were tweeting and I, I found her posts are useful. Um, so that's another person I follow. Um, so you as future doctors or people teaching future that, you know, it's, be somebody to interest. Um, here are some statistics about Twitter. Um, I think AHPM has a you know, big handle on how many people are tweeting. Because um, I, I tweeted at AGS and there was not that many people tweeting. <laughs> but but AHPM, I, um, if you see the numbers, when they first started tweeting in 2009, there was only like 224 tweets, so that's not very much. Uh, but in 2011, there was almost 3,000 tweets, so a little bit more than one per participant, you know, the people at the meeting. Uh, and that was in Vancouver, we had to pay extra money for the internet, so I'm suspecting that this year when the internet is going to be free in the convention center in Denver, that we're going to have a lot more tweets. But uh, also the number of people that are contributing, I mean, a lot, a lot of people um, uh, in, in 2011. Uh, and so then this is kind of like my notes. What became my notes from, uh, so, so, so you see a tweet, you're like, this a little button that's like a star and it says favorite. <clears throat> so I save those. And so if there's something I, you know, I see and I like, then I, I favorite. And then I can come back later and look at it and be under my favorites. Uh, so, you know, like this is some notes of uh, what somebody said in a session about communication. Um, and then here is like, here's the link. Here's a link of this article, this poem that was cited by this person. Um, so they kind of became like my notes. Um, I think Bini Aurora had a nice uh, quote about what Twitter was like, and she said, describe Twitter like being a big cocktail party where you're just kind of dipping in different sections, and you, you know, you don't feel like you have to talk to everybody. But if you're like just kind of like, okay, well, I'm interested in this medical education or palliative medicine, what what you're tweeting, then you can kind of follow that or not, like. I have, depends, when I'm too busy, I don't have time to be following, and it's okay, but um, anyway, so a little bit of the tweet chat, <coughs> it started in July 2010, um, it's on Wednesdays at 8 central time, um, 
and it's been growing rapidly actually like I was uh, one of the you know one of the people that were constant and actually lately I haven't been going but it's still a lot of people are uh, regulars um, so if you can see the statistics of the HPM health tag uh, obviously this was the day that had the most was the Wednesday so that's why it has the higher peak um, <coughs> Uh, so this is, uh, well, the way I do a tweet chat, I go to this website, it's called tweetchat.com. And uh, you put here, once you log in with your Twitter ID, or you can you can put a hashtag, but then you can't comment if you don't want to put an account. Uh, but like here, I would put um, pound H, I mean, here's the pounds on array, so you just put HPM. Um, so that's kind of like assigning a classroom, like, so we're all seeing the HPM classroom. Um, and so then the way it goes, somebody is the moderator, and the example I have here, that's one time that I was hosting. Um, so there's a code, I put like T1 means topic one. Uh, so because, you know, we, we're short on characters, so we have to kind of create. So T1, so that means, uh, so I suggested, well, do terminally ill people who are full code get treated differently from those who are DNR, and then, um, so then, this person says, T1, great question. Sometimes I feel like the folks that are, uh, are somewhat impatient with the guys who are full code. Um, then here's somebody who's like a lay person, who's like, um, I don't know what you're talking about, you know. And so it's a very, you know, very group. We have some people are doctors, nurses, social workers, um, and we also have some people that are caregivers, like, you know, these people. Um, Mark told me, like, yes, I'm the guy with the GED, I can't decide, but <laughs> from the family member point, so it's, it, it's kind of interesting, and I've, you know, had some, we've had some good interactions in Twitter, I, I just haven't been participating as much, because I've started going to the meta chat, and that's on Thursdays, and then I can't do to each, because <laughs> I can, it's just too much, but, um, so anyway, this is how you do it. I hope you can try it. But like when you're when you're in the HPM and you want to tweet, that's that would be what I would follow to tweet chat uh, because that's how I would favorite. So I can this the little story. That's how it, I would favorite, and the, because otherwise it's just gonna be lost and you're not gonna be able to go back to that specific tweet. Um, but if you wanna like if you like what somebody said, uh, you can click in that little arrow and that's a, a retweet this one um, and that's kind of like an endorsement like I really like what you said you know let me pass it on to my other families uh, I mean other followers um, so a little bit of a visual so we're all here in a circle watching the tweet chat and there may be other people that are not participating in the tweet chat but they may be seeing what we're um, posting um, so we're following the same trend <coughs> so I in another one that I participated, I made a comment. Uh, uh, well, there are many children with longer lives with complex chronic diseases in the entire care. We were talking about pediatric palliative care that day. Uh, so somebody who's look may not be looking at the tweet chat, but may have seen looking for the HPM <coughs> tag later. So Diane, I remember she's my hero. She retweeted me once. <laughs> so anyway, so she was looking at that and then so passed on to her followers. Um, so sometimes it's like, well, I don't have that many followers. Yeah, but if you're using hashtags, um, so if I use like pound HPM or pound healthcare social media or pound meded, uh, then that then you get noticed uh, because every now and then, like you know, I posted something that was useful for medical education, and then uh, so so then I started getting some followers of, of people that are medical educators, um, and that's how I got identified and I be, started to be listed in medical educators people. Um, how has been tutoring the medical literature? Um, there was an interesting article about how they looked at the tweets during the H1 and A1 epidemic, and uh, and just like um, it was going on in in real time, um, where initially it was called the swine flu, and then it went more appropriate into the um, H1N1. Now it down. Um, the same thing happened with tweets. Some were, you know, given information. Some were more personal. You know, some family member has uh, H1N1. Um, and there's also several reflection pieces about how Twitter has been useful to connect with other people. Um, there was uh, something that was shared in NPR uh, about they were looking at the mood of people depending on 
how the tweets went throughout the day and the best time was like early in the morning or late at night. Uh, although, anyway, that helps a lot. Anyway, <laughs> um, they've used Twitter as a survey. Um, I saw that there was this nurse that had their students develop like 140 character notes. Like, do you have like a program like that? And then you have to challenge because you have to narrow down your signs, then fit it into 140 notes. They, so they, this tweets that the students made, they became um, like the students notes, like the flashcards. Um, and then there was a uh, article uh, about it was in the Journal of Internet Medicine, which I just found out thanks to Twitter, um, about whether tweets could predict citations. So they looked at um, you know articles within that journal to see you know how often they were tweeted and if that would predict that this article would cited you know like the regular way in in um, other articles you know throughout time. Um, and they noticed that, in fact, that if, you know, articles that peaked on the first, you know, first day since they were published, the first three days, that in the long run they would be, again, the articles that were going to be um, cited more. Um, well, Twitter can also end up being like a peer review and, and people can be tougher on Twitter, uh, you know, because right now if you're in a conference and, you know, somebody could tweet, oh, this sucks, this talk sucks. <laughs> Or they had, you know, like somebody actually tweeted and to put a picture of this uh, very bad PowerPoint. So they can be harsher and <laughs> less uh, nicer than in person if you do an evaluation. So, um, you know, that's something that can happen. Um, so how can you start? What what will be useful? Um, there's this website um, that it's the healthcare hashtag. So it's a project that gathers all the hashtags and then whatever you're interested in, then you can look at. Uh, for example, I think I have a mix. Yeah. So here are some. There's some hashtags that are also a chat, meaning that actually there's people meeting at a certain time of the day um, and they're conversing about stuff. But uh, so here are some that may interest you. There's a health, um, HPM, the hospice and palliative media. Then HCSM is healthcare social media. I believe their tweet chat is on Sundays. And then there's a med med ed tweet chat that one's on Thursdays at eight o'clock. Uh, and then there's the inner life uh, chat, and that was on Wednesdays at nine o'clock our time. Um, then there's an elder care chat. There's one about CME chat, and it's like, a, how do you do CME, and how um, how you get it known? Um, there's another one. It's the National Healthcare Decision Day, and it always happens on the 16th of the month. So it varies depending on what day it is, because it, you know there's always death and taxes. So somebody came up with the oh well, National Healthcare Decision Day is the day after you do your taxes, which is April 16th, so then, um, so that's why they do it, um, you know, on the 16th, and this is kind of related to um, healthcare decisions. Um, but if you go to the website, and I, I, I can email people, or you can just put, you know, healthcare hashtags into your, well, you know, free chat in your search, search engine, and you'll, you'll get there, um, and you'll, you can see the schedule. I'm sure they have something for pharmacists, but if you just look. Um, and uh, also you may not know exactly who you follow, but there's people that have created lists where they, you know, where they put people that, like these are some of the lists that I'm listed in. Uh, so Paul Tatum, Doc Tatum, he's a geriatrician and palliative medicine doctor, so that's a person you can follow. Uh, he has a list of, of Jerry Doc. so instead of you having to go through each of those, if you just follow that list, you're going to see all the people that he's got listed. Um, then this, I, I mean, several people that have like a palliative list. These people have um, Eric Widera is another geriatrician palliative medicine uh, doctor. He has another a palliative care list. Kristen Sinclair has one hospice palliative care people. Um, then Luke, a librarian. This is the our librarian here at UTESCA, and and he found me because I would when I was introducing me in, in the tweet chat, I would say, oh, I work at UTESCA. I use the ha the Pound and and that's how he he follows that pound and he noticed me, um, and anyway so that's how he found me and um, when I presented family medicine grand rounds uh, back in October I I'm like yeah well who knows I'll tweet about it since it's live stream, so I tweeted about it and I put a couple of hashtags well he retweeted me and one of his followers was a lady in Indiana some librarian 
And then she tweeted, oh, watching that Jenna Ross present Family Medicine Mama. So I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so there's some, you know, somebody I don't know that was, you know, followed this link and um, was watching me in cyberspace and I wasn't even aware. Um, so this is how, you know, you can give yourself more power if you, if you start tweeting, people will come and people will notice you. Um, you just, just kind of have to go and use the hashtags. Any other comments about Twitter? I spent a lot. So when you're talking about the general categories, like when you said like the pound and the HPM category, mm -hmm. you have to put that in the tweet that you post for other people to yeah for other people to see to look at that if they're following like pound HPM, HPM or whatever yes. it is. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And I have, if you don't, then there's not a way that other people just looking will see. Them. Then you're only your whatever followers you have, and I don't, I don't have that many. I have 150 or something, but they're they're not. If I put the hashtag, then I'll probably get more thousands of people that are following okay. that might see me. Um, that if I don't use a hashtag, and and it depends on the topic, then I use more than one. If it applies to both medical education and the care, then you would I would put in. pound medit, pound HPM. Um, yeah. Um, and this is, uh, and at first I didn't know like the lingo and the proper etiquette, and I would just, just I just need to get started because I found so Kristen Sinclair and other people were my mentor, like your Twitter mentors. <laughs> so you know, I mean, tweet, Twitter people are really friendly, and, you know. So you just start tweeting, and then you'll learn, you know, more of them, more refined. Because then I, he would retweet me, and then do the hash. I'm like, oh, okay, that's how you do it. <laughs> and then you may also want to use a, um, you know, a URL short, shortening website like Tiny URL or uh, Bitly. Um, it, there's many that turn your, you know, link that's this many words to something that's just a few letters because we have only 140 characters. Um, so YouTube, it's a video sharing website. It started in 2005 as uh, a pilot in February and in November 2005 more uh, open to the people. Uh, the requirement is that it has to be a video that you created or your friends and that you have the rights to use it, that it's less than 15 minutes. Um, and really most of the content they have is user uploaded. Um, and uh, again, the, the user is not just young people, or, you know, it's, a significant, it's kind of evenly distributed with different age groups, and again, uh, the older group is the growing one. This is how many videos I've loaded to YouTube every minute, 24 hours, and it's just amazing. So yes, you may think that's a place where you go to see the babies dancing, teenage, okay, you know, there's this one about the little baby following that Lady Gaga and dancing. <laughs> And uh, this one, Charlie bit my finger again. It has it's something ridiculous, like eight million views. I can't remember. It, yeah, anyway, you can look it in your first time. Um, you know, but there's other stuff. Um, you know, the CDC has their own um, channel that's interesting. Um, here are the life before death videos. That's something that we should look at as HPM. They have like 50 videos of what about what it is. Um, like every week they would come up with one new one and that was what they were doing last year um, about what it is to be in pain and not have access to pain medicine or about living with serious illness um, and they're all you know short uh, clips but they're very well done um, here's this support you're sick you're serious that's the one with the American Academy of Palliative Medicine and I, I think I've shown most of the fellows that opioid dysmorphia dance that's the one with the Jerry Ball people <laughs> Um, so, you know, there's different kind of stuff and some it's, it's more educative. This is what University Health System has. They have a channel and like, so I don't know, for the people at University, you know, may want to think about doing a little patient interview and a little success story with a palliative care patient. Um, I think, well, we could probably do it here, but we have to kind of figure out more of the legal implication, make sure we can have representation. Um, they also have this uh, university system has this Mrs. Munoz says and she has like advice and puts on screen and stuff like that. Although I, they're not that viewed. I mean they that one had only like sixty three views and you know, so I guess they need to do a little bit more promoting so people can see the videos. Um, so as far as the medical study that that I found on YouTube they um, there was one where they uh, looked at cancer, breast cancer, and they found about 35 
uh, videos that had like different narratives about what it was like to be diagnosed with breast cancer, dealing with the healthcare system. Uh, so, so you know, people are reaching out and putting their own information or putting their, you know, there's a lot of people that are seriously ill of mine and they are putting their videos. And one of the videos that has been going on, um, you know, that's like one of the high circulated videos in YouTube right now was this uh, boy that was like 16 years old and he had a congenital heart condition and he died in, I think he was from Austin. And he died like two weeks ago, maybe. And he, like two days before he died, he put a little video where oh, he's putting. Yeah, yeah, Bridlow, sure. where he's putting little things of, and it's all just little cards. Um, so there's a lot of people that have serious illness and they're kind of broadcasting all what it's like. Um, um, there was these studies that were had like a similar methodology where they um, were looking at uh, videos in YouTube for social information. That's where our patients are going. Um, so they would look at all the videos on a certain topic and then analyze it and then, you know, overall the more um, accurate information was found if, if, if it was designed by a university or uh, rather than, you know, some had some quack methods or things that are not really proven that they were trying to sell. Uh, so you kind of have to be careful, but if, if you identify something that's useful to you, I mean, you, you could use it with your patients, something that's well done, or you could generate your own. Um, Okay, so that's YouTube. Um, so I'm going to move on to blogs. So a blog, it, what it is, is a journal that is updated and it's intended for people to read. Um, it generally represents, reflects the personality of the authors or authors that run the site. Um, here's the Jerry Powell blog. It's the Jerry it's a palliative care blog and they are um, pretty active. They have been and they actually, if you you should check it out now. They have um, two interesting, very interesting posts about the copyright of the MMSC and how the MMSC, you know, the owners of the uh, copyright are um, suing people that are using the MMSC. And, um, you know, they have these discussions about, like, you know, they were also suing up people who were, like, had the right had instruments that were in some ways based on the MMSE, but they're like, like this post is really interesting. It's like, oh really? Well, what? let's see where the MMSE came from. And they went back and looked at all these other posts at, at other sources and they found, you know, orientation and uh, items of, that are used in the MMSE in some paper of 1945. So it's like, oh, okay, well, what about you? And what about your, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that that's, Check it out. They have an app in your iPhone if you want. It's an easy way to read it. If, you know, if you're waiting for the elevator that's too slow or something like that. I, I you know, I, I think they put stuff that's really insightful. Uh, Prism SA, that's our um, professional interest group in, in social media. That's our San Antonio um, page. Uh, they've been kind of quiet lately, but um, they also put interest. There's some blogs from patients. Um, the, this one is about a person that's really educated and he has Alzheimer's disease and he writes about what it's like. Um, and then this was uh, Sarah Chiji, she had uh, um, cancer in the, that was in the arm and we, we talked about it in another session with the last year fellows. Um, so how do I keep up with this? I mean, what do you think? I'm a busy person, right? So here, I'm going to share my secret with you is called the RSS feed, the really simple syndication. So this will make it a little more simple. So if you go the old way and like, okay, well, let me see what they have in the Jerry Powell website. Let me see what they have in Telemed. Let me see what they have. That's very slow and that's not very good use of my time to go to all these websites. So when I, when you see that little orange icon like this in the websites and you click on it and you subscribe to it, um, then you can what happens is the opposite. Instead of me going to all those websites, I, you have to have a, a, a reader. I use the Google uh, RSS reader, or there's a part in your email where you can do your Outlook, the section that says RSS, is, that's what this is. So then every time there's something new, instead of me going to all these pages, they're like, okay, here's another post, here's another post, here's another post, and I don't have to be searching anything. So just, so this is my Google homepage. So if you can see, <coughs> You know, like this is from this morning, so here's the link to the MMSC. So that's why I saw it because when I go to my homepage, 
um, I have personalized and I already have, you know, I follow the future docs, here's a PRISM essay, here's a journal, Patio Medicine, um, which I'm uh, uh, one of the bloggers. Um, actually, like this post, this is the one we put from our medical student. Um, and then the Patio Med blog, and then I've been following this other blog called the thepaintpuppets.org. Um, so, so far, because I don't follow that many, this format works for me rather than using the big RSS feeds, but there's also, you know, you can join RSS feed for your journals that you like, um, and, but this, for me, it's, it's good. Uh, there's a, this other group that I follow a little bit, this Mother in Medicine, Mothers in Medicine, they have different groups, um, you know, just a variety of doctors that are, uh, in, or medical students, um, so I'm going to exemplify, if you still not quite convinced why the social media is powerful. This is an example of what happened with mor morphine in 2009. So here's the FDA put the little obscure announcement about, okay, well, we're going to halt the marketing of certain uh, drugs. And among us was our beloved um, concentrated morphine because they hand on the full details, um, studies to prove their efficiency, even though you know, we've been using it all the time, and we knew that they were effective, that we didn't really have all the information, so they said, uh, this was March 31st, okay, well, as of June 2nd, that's going to stop, and fortunately, somebody <laughs> saw it, and uh, posted on Facebook, hey, all you um, hospice and medical courts, what are your thoughts about this, and it's like, here's the link, and well, what is this going on? Oh my gosh, things are going to change. Uh, you know, and somebody puts it on Twitter too. I just saw an advisory that said that other approved opioids are being withdrawn from the market. Um, and again, it got retweeted. And so, you know, a lot of people were noticing this link. Then they put, you know, within 12 hours, there's a blog in, um, on the PalyMed website about the FDA, chocolate, hospice world, no more rocks and all. Um, so this is kind of what happened. On March 31st, there's an announcement. There's maybe something in the mail. Um, there's some RSSD. People notice it's on Twitter, Facebook, Taliban. So these people that notice, they're all writing letters, writing emails um, on the phone, uh, communicating also with HPM and the HPN which is the association for the nurses. Uh, so they all get together, communicate with uh, Congress, they communicate with the FDA. There's a Facebook group on Let's Keep Morphine On. Um, so by April 9, the FDA reverses the calling. Now, yeah, um, let's go back a little bit. I say it was in 2009. Let's say it would have been five years earlier, 2004. Well, there's not that many. The Twitter didn't exist, Parliament didn't exist, you know, would have this happened? Yeah, but how long would have it been taken? You know, maybe it would have gone into June and it's like, oh wait, why don't we have any more morphine? Uh, and then that would have happened much later. Uh, but I think that social media did play a, you know, role on, on how this happens sooner. Uh, and just to kind of wrap it up, here are some um, potential pitfalls of social media. Uh, I mean, I think you need to remember if you're, you know, you're one person here and you're one person in the electronic world, and if there's something you want to say or do in person, then why do you say it or do it electronically? Uh, you know, people are unemployable because they put stuff in their Facebook page and that was inappropriate, like drinking or whatever, and I know there's several like medical schools or you know residencies that they search the candidates um, Facebook page to see if there's anything inappropriate and I was reading a post about a student that was saying noticing that her friends were changing their you know putting a nice profile picture or changing the you know it used to be at first everybody had their page that was insecure but now most people have their page secure but at least you know your profile page has to be nice. Um, um, there's people that are changing the letters so that in case the program are looking for them, they can't find them. But I, you know, that's not something we do because I, since we can't get access to everybody's Facebook page, then it would be inappropriate that you know we find it goes to somebody's Facebook page and then find something we don't like and it's like okay, well let's not take this person. 
but it's kind of unfair because there might be another person that's just not posting it or I just don't have access to their profile. Um, but there's been, you know, elderly woman, a uh, man that has, uh, hit another one in the nursing home and put a knife on them and ER nurses and other personnel in the hospital thought that was amazing and put it on the website. They got fired in the California hospital. Uh, so, you, I mean, you have to have sense, I mean, and just because you own your iPhone or whatever, you just can't take pictures of patients just where you are, because you, um, and here's an article on JAMA, it was kind of looking at the, you know, what the concept of the medical student was, um, and, you know, a lot, a lot of this, medical schools don't have that many, don't have specific policies for social media. And the ones that do probably have some that are restricted, but you know, people have gotten in trouble with their problems uh, for putting that. Well, also, a famous case about a nurse that put a picture of her on a placenta, and that also she's not a nursing student anymore. And it's like some of these things are like common sense, but I guess it's not common sense for some people. Um, there was this other study about physicians on Twitter. <clears throat> so they looked at, you know, doctors that had that identify themselves as doctor on Twitter and they had at least 500 followers on at least 20 tweets. Um, and, you know, this is kind of what they did. And then they analyzed the tweets um, and, you know, there were about 3% of the tweets that were unprofessional. Um, so, um, and this is a survey that they did in the Journal of Internal Medicine um, just to how do you use the networking? And this was medical student residents and physicians. Um, and this also seems a little bit disturbing that 15% of them had visited the profile of a patient or a family member of a patient. Um, and some of them had noticed that the patient or family member were visiting their site. Uh, and some of them received a friend request. And some of them had 5% requ had requested to be friends of the family member. Um, and what my take on it is that. I mean, if you're, I mean, I can see where, you know, there's some people that you're friends in real life besides having a professional relationship, well, then maybe you could friend them. But if you're not, I mean, if you're not real friends in real life, then why would you friend them online? I mean, that seems awkward to me, but anyway. Uh, we do have a, a social media policies for the Veterans Affair, um, and it just came in June 2011. Uh, and it's actually pretty encouraging of people to, you know, be, use social networks, use it responsibly, and that, you know, unless you are officially, you know, if you're not the official South Texas veteran, you know, person running the account of the, you, you really can't comment at all. You, you, all your comments are your own. Um, there's another AMA policy policy is kind of vague, but it's there. Um, there's a healthcare blogger code of ethics. Uh, the Utesca Radio Medication has a policy, so you guys may want to check it because you're uh, followed by it. Um, so here are some tips of how to uh, avoid HIPAA violation. Don't talk about patients. That's just easier if you're not about it. Um, there was this doctor, I think she was in the Canadian art doctor, she didn't mention any of the patient's HIP identifiers, but she mentioned enough details about this patient that somebody else figured out who she was talking about, and she got suspended by the board of Rhode Island. I mean, so seriously, <laughs> that, that's not the, this is not the arena where you're going to discuss your patient. So, uh, don't give medical advice because, you know, it's, it's hard, you, you don't really know these patients. Uh, but don't be anonymous because if, when you're anonymous, you think you have this protection. But if you're just you, I mean, you, I mean, you're only seeing one Janet Ross, the same one that you see here is the same one you see online. So don't, you know, so just be, you know, just don't be anonymous because that gives you a chill that you don't really have, and they could still find who you are. Um, there was oh, there was another funny story about this doctor anonymous that was blogging during his um, trial. Well, the other uh, lawyer attorney figure out who this person was, and then guess how the case went. <laughs> so, anyways, but um, so if you wouldn't sit in the cafeteria near a big table of patients and their family, well, don't put it online because it's an even bigger table with a bigger lot or more people. If you put it out there, somebody is gonna see it. Um, 
so anyway. So social media and networking is all around you. Everybody, patients and providers are using social media and everything's happening and how are you getting involved? Um, this is just the beginning. And I thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Phil has one. And there's lots of ways that you can get a hold of me. <laughs> But I don't, I mean, on Facebook, if you, it's more, I just do more personal stuff and put keep pictures of my children, and it's not nothing, you know, so it's, it's, I keep that more for, you know. How much time per day do you spend with this stuff? You. Oh, me? I don't know. It kind of varies because in the, you know, like in the weekends, I spend more time, like that's when I go on Twitter. <coughs> I would say probably half hour, 45 minutes a day, because I would, you know, like I, I, when I get home, you know, I just do it on my phone. It's just so easy, because any moment that I'm like, you know, cafeteria line, yeah. <laughs> it's because it's on my mobile device, but I, and then, I, you know, maybe it depends if there's a blog post, then I'm maybe done, uh, but about 30 minutes on a regular work day, and then, in the weekend more, maybe an hour, two hours. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, I have some connections and networking and, you know, that I wouldn't have if I didn't participate. And I don't know, like the tweet chat, I mean, I think we have relevant discussions and then, you know, like several times, like before I had to give a talk or something, I would post things on them and then I got some interesting response I'm like, well, hey, okay, I hadn't thought about that. Um, you know, it's just a nice sounding board and then, you know, people I would have not met had I not been you know, networking. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Best, have you used uh, Dynamed or do people do use Dynamed things for, like, is it supposed to be evidence-based things? and? I'm not familiar with that one. Because there's just so many things out there, I mean, that I just, no, I just limit myself. Mostly Facebook and Twitter is what I do. Um, in Twitter, I get more of the professional things. That, I mean, Facebook is more socializing. <coughs> uh, I mean, a little bit of the you know, same links, and, you know, if I find something interesting, I mean, like I put links like, you know, 93 year old woman that thinks yoga is still, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. I, you know, if I see a story like that, I'm sharing both places. Um, but I mean, Facebook, I do more person, mostly personal, and a little bit professional, but mostly personal. Um, I mean, I'm like LinkedIn, that's supposed to be more like a professional Facebook. Um, but I, I mean, I'm in there and I go there a little bit, but I don't know. I don't interact as much. Uh, I mean, I'm not like actively posting stuff there. I, I don't know. I guess because I was already on Facebook and I just kind of like, okay, well, here's another place to be in. But I find LinkedIn is more like a, you know, it's like an online CV in some ways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. If you haven't signed in, please sign in now before we leave.